Hello, and welcome to this presentation on airway management of the burn patient. My name is Jocelyn Hills. I'm one of the nurse practitioners with Burner Reconstructive Centers of America. I've been taking care of burn patients for approximately the past two decades. The objectives of, of today's presentation are to describe the different airway injuries, as well as the pathophysiology and the management of those airway injuries, and then some of the adjunctive therapies. Initial assessment and management is the same in every single patient, airway, breathing, and circulation. It is very important, though, to overlook the burn injury to be certain that there is not another injury, such as a trauma, that may pay, pose a greater risk to the patient's life. Airway, though, is the number one cause of death prior to arrival at the emergency department for burn patients. After the primary survey is completed, we then will begin a secondary survey that consists of a history, a head-to-toe physical exam, as well as laboratory studies. Airway and smoke inhalation account for 20 to 30 percent of all burn admissions in the United States. 60 to 70 percent of the patients who die from burn injuries have an airway inhalation, I'm sorry, an airway injury that is associated with their burn component. In the burn world, we think about three dip different types of inhalation injury, injury above the glottis, below the glottis, and then systemic poisoning, such as carbon monoxide poisoning or cyanide toxicity. When we think about injury above the glottis, we think about the upper airway, and this is the most common injury. When you have an upper airway injury, you think about the injury affecting the soft tissue in the upper airway and noting that most of that heat is dissipated above the cords. A delayed response may be noted in patients who have been under resuscitated as they begin to receive those fluids from fluid resuscitation, the swelling may then begin to develop. Diagnosis of upper airway injury from laryngoscopy and just abnor noting abnormal edema or soot in the airway. Remembering that an upper airway injury can cause edema to form and can close off that airway. So it is something to be very cognizant of and watch monitor very closely. We think about injury below the glottis. This is what we refer to as really a true inhalation injury. When a patient has often been exposed to a prolonged chemical or smoke exposure when they're burned in an enclosed space, this increases the mortality up to 50%. Staging is difficult, uh, requires bronchoscopy, and the onset of the symptoms can be unpredictable. So we need to observe these patients for at least 24 hours. And a mucosal sloughing, which does develop in these airway injuries and injuries below the glottis, will often take several days to begin to... When we look at this picture, we note the airway is coated with soot. You can see where they have inhaled soot down into their airway. And this is a picture from a bronchoscopy on admission. So I want you to note in this picture, the surrounding tissue is a light pink, the normal healthy tissue, normal color of our airway. So we bronch this patient 24 hours later, you can see the damage that has been done to the airway. I'm gonna go back the slide and here we're going to lavage and suction out and try to clean out as much as we can of the soot that is sitting on that airway. But remember that those that soot that is there is also a toxin causing damage as they have inhaled that heat and the toxins. It doesn't show immediately. So again, 24 hours later, you can see how significant this injury is, how edematous the airway is, and the, the cherry red color where that tissue has been damaged. So again, when we think about injury below the glottis, chemical or prolonged smoke exposure increases the mortality by up to 50%, and the staging is difficult. Then we think about systemic poisoning. When we consider this, most commonly what comes to mind is carbon monoxide poisoning as well as cyanide toxicity, which is becoming more and more recognized across the nation. Carbon monoxide poisoning is well documented to be the number one cause of death prior to arrival at the emergency department. 
And we think about carbon monoxide as a colorless, odorless gas. Uh, many of us have carbon monoxide detectors in our homes, and everybody should. Uh, what happens with carbon monoxide is it binds the hemoglobin, so that oxygen delivery is impaired. So basically, the oxygen is not getting to the cellular level because the carbon monoxide molecule is binding to the hemoglobin, and it has a 200 times greater affinity. So so the oxygen is in the bloodstream, but it's not getting to the cellular level. And this shifts the oxygen dissociation curve to the left. So we think about the fact that carbon monoxide binds to nitric oxide receptors on the heme, uh, causing free radical damage. And the lipid peroxidation inflammatory changes that take place affect not only the brain, but also the myocardium. And there's focal ne necrosis as well as white matter demyelination. Some of the signs and symptoms that we may be familiar with with carbon monoxide poisoning are a headache, uh, dilation of the cutaneous vessels. People will say that there's a cherry red color, um, tightness over the forehead, throbbing in the temples. Often patients will become confused, um, they're not making sense, they will be unstable. Once we get to those higher levels, patients will have lost consciousness, they may develop convulsions and eventually death. So the best treatment for carbon monoxide poisoning is 100% oxygen. Your half-life of carboxyhemoglobin on room air is four hours. If we put 100% FiO2 on those patients, that drops it down to less than an hour. And then hyperbaric oxygen therapy, or HBO, that half-life is less than 30 minutes. We do use hyperbarics, and we use this for patients who have a carboxyhemoglobin level that is greater than 25, or patients with symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. We will go ahead and dive to prevent any sequela that may develop. So hyperbaric oxygen has been shown to rapidly reduce the effects of carbon monoxide poisoning. And it's really when we think about what is hyperbaric oxygen, it's pressing the oxygen into the tissue. And it does have an anti-inflammatory effect. Something else that's really been studied more recently and has come to the forefront in many areas of the country and is being taken into the pre-hospital world is treatment of cyanide toxicity. It is increasingly becoming, um, I would say popular, um, but noted um, in the pre-hospital world to treat patients for cyanide toxicity and the use of the cyano kit, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But cyanide is, has been noted to be elevated in many people who were found dead at the scene, which previously was always thought to be carbon monoxide poisoning, but cyanide toxicity or to toxic levels of cyanide uh, are now noted to, being noted in patients with elevated carboxyhemoglobin levels and that are down or dead at the scene. So we think about how does cyanide toxicity occur? It can occur through inhalation, ingestion, parental administration, as well as dermal absorption. So how does it cause damage? The cyanide attaches to the metallic enzymes, rendering them inactive. So what's that really mean? And it it inhibits the cellular respiration even when you have adequate oxygenation um, or oxygen levels in the blood. So this increases the lactic acid. Um, we note that in patients that come in, they have a refractory elevated lactic acid as well as an acidosis. Those patients are often uh, have elevated cyanide levels. The tissues that have the highest oxygen requirements are definitely the most profoundly affected. When we think about this, we know that that is your heart and your brain. So when we think about cyanide toxicity, again, we're thinking about enclosed space, multiple deaths, and possible collective hysteria. Uh, is exposures to things that are burning, such as wood, 
silk, plastic, and polyurethanes. So the, those toxins are released when these objects burn. So we think about soot in the mouth, altered mental status, and profound hypotension. Also hypotension that does not respond to fluid challenges. Um, we immediately think about cyanide toxicity. So cyanide levels that are greater than 40 millimoles per liter or one milligram per liter indicate toxicity. And the results are too delayed to be clinically useful in real time. So we have to assume that there is cyanide toxicity if we see some of these things that happen, such as this hypotension, lactic levels that are greater than 10, or refractory acidosis. We think about also cyanide levels. There is no hospital that I have ever been associated with or that I know of that actually does cyanide levels at the hospital. They're all send out. And so by the time those cyanide levels come back, the patient is often already deceased. So symptoms that we're looking for, weakness, malaise, collapse. From a neurologic standpoint, headache dizziness, vertigo, progressing to confusion, and then again, seizures and coma. Notice that these are very similar to your symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. So abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and from a cardiopulmonary standpoint, shortness of breath, chest pain, and apnea. So the vital signs we have the initial hypertension followed by hypotension, bradycardia, reflex tachycardia, and then hypotension. People will often say that there's a cherry red skin discoloration, as well as a bright red retinal um, note to the, ar the uh, retinal artery and veins. And then we have dilation of the pupils. Uh, I personally have never noted a bitter almond smell, but that is well documented also. So again, you'll see that the treatment is the same for cyanide toxicity as it is for carbon monoxide poisoning, and that's 100% FiO2, a supportive care, and then antidotes. Many uh, counties as well as regions in the United States, um, EMS is now carrying cyano kits on their trucks, and they will deploy if patients are found down at the scene from a, an enclosed space injury. The cyanide antidote kit contains amyl nitrate, sodium nitrate, and sodium thiosulfate. And there is also the hydroxycobalamin kit. Uh, this, the cyanide antidote kit is not used nearly as often as the cyano kit, uh, but we'll go through it quickly in case you happen to come upon it. And it has an Amyl nitrate pearls, the sodium nitrate again, and the sodium thiosulfate. And this rapidly induces the methemoglobinemia, which rapidly binds with the cyanide and helps to excrete the cyanide. This can be dangerous when used with carbon monoxide poisoning because you're decreasing your oxygen binding capacity. The sodium thiosulfate converts cyanide to thiocyanide, which is renally excreted. Again, the action is delayed. And again, and also the cyanide antidote kit is associated with vasodilation, leading to more profound hypotension. There's no dosing that is established in children and is not good for field administration, really secondary to the hypotension and hypoxic effects that it can have. On the other hand, the hydro hydroxycobalamin really is vitamin B12. So this is very safe for pre-hospital administration. Uh, the, it comes prepared in a five gram tube, which as many of you will know, is a very, very large dose of vitamin B12. It may and does cause discoloration of both the urine and the skin. And 
there may be some synergistic effects with the sodium thiosulfate, but primarily the hydroxycobalamin is used independently. Remember, you want a separate IV line for this. It should not be infused in the same line with Valium, dopamine, dobutamine, or sodium thiosulfate. There are some long-term neuropsychological effects that are possible with uh, cyanide toxicity, including Parkinson-like syndromes. This is very poorly studied. I do anticipate that we will be seeing more and more of these studies done in the next, um, or in the next years and upcoming um, decades. The goal is to anticipate respiratory involvement when you're responding to a scene or when patients are admitted into the ER or into the burn center. So your number one risk factor of an inhalation injury is being burned in an enclosed space. So think about patients who are in structure fires or in car fires. Knowing the mechanism of injury is very important. And that's one of our first questions is what happened? Where were they? Were they outside throwing gas on a trash fire or were they in a an enclosed space where they could inhale all of the toxins and the soot and the and develop those carbon deposits and the toxicities that they are exposed to when materials are burning and releasing those toxins. Do they have singed nasal hairs, burns to the face, neck, or lips, carbonaceous material in or around the mouth? And hoarseness, strider, or respiratory changes can be noted and are noted. Those are usually late signs of patients with an inhalation injury and indicate an immediate need for intubation. It's not always easy to determine whether somebody has an inhalation injury or not. When we look at this picture, significant injury to the face, significant singeing to the hair, but this patient was outside at a bonfire when an aerosol can exploded. So he was not in an enclosed space, but he's going to have some significant facial edema. Thankfully, he was not very far from the burn center when this occurred. He was able to be admitted and monitored very closely. I would not fault anybody for intubating this patient. So it's not always an easy decision to make, and we would rather err on the side of caution. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the initial assessment and management of injury in a burn patient, as well as the current treatments that are available. Certainly would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Again, my name is Jocelyn Hills with Burner Reconstructive Centers of America. Thank you and have a great day.